The Panorama by Sixth Sense Fishing. These baits debuted in the fall of 2023, more than a year ago, but we are still coming up with new ways to rig and fish this bait. But one thing is for certain, this bait catches fish. I've been experimenting with the Panorama for the past several weeks now, and I've come up with several different viable rigging methods, as well as some hacks that may help you catch even more fish on these baits. We're gonna get right into it, but before we do, if you guys do enjoy the video today or learn something of value here, I'd appreciate it if you'd like, comment, or subscribe. It helps the channel grow. Let's start with rigging methods. Now, my approach to this was to find rigging methods that accentuate the actions or abilities that are a natural byproduct of the panorama's unique design. And I've identified four of these natural actions or abilities, the first of which is undulation, which means to move in a wavy motion. And this results from the panorama's thin, flexible, soft plastic construction, which is tapered toward the tail of the bait. The second natural action or ability of the panorama is the ability to glide, which results from the wide, flat side profile of the baits, as well as the buoyancy of the plastic. Without a hook to weigh them down, these baits will actually float in the water, which can be handy because if you lose them on a hook set or they just get pulled off your hook for any reason, they'll float to the surface where you can retrieve them. The third natural action or ability of the panorama is the ability to flutter. Because these baits are balanced, adding weight in specific places on the bait in your presentation can cause the bait to flutter erratically, which serves well to imitate an injured bait fish. The fourth, and I believe the most often overlooked natural action or ability of the panorama is the ability to displace water. Everyone knows that the panorama can slice or glide through the water because of its thin, flat design, but when you move it sideways through the water, that wider flat surface of the bait can move water like you would not believe. And now let's take a look at some rigging methods that capitalize on these natural actions and abilities. All right, I just want to preface these demonstrations by letting you know that I'm going to be showing you some underwater footage taken in my mini testing tank. And while my tank is definitely too small to properly demonstrate these techniques, I believe it is enough to show you how the bait will behave while using each of these different rigging methods. So just know that I know that the tank is small, okay? I know. So the first rigging method I want to show you guys is one that is already popular, and that is the weightless Texas rig. And starting with the five inch size and up, these baits are definitely heavy enough to cast weightless. The five inch bait weighs approximately one half of an ounce and the 6.5 inch weighs about 1.1 ounces and the giant nine inch panorama weighs about three ounces. But while these plastics do have some weight to them, the castability is hindered because these baits are not aerodynamic whatsoever. Because of this, I would recommend that you fish the five inch weightless on spinning gear but the 6.5 and 9 inch baits can be fished on casting gear. Now, when you drop below the 5 inch size down to the 3 inch, the weight drops off dramatically. The 3 inch bait only weighs 0.17 ounces, so less than a fifth of an ounce. So even on spinning gear, the weightless presentation won't really be viable for those smaller baits. Now, out of all of the presentations that I'm going to be showing you today, the weightless presentation is the one that best capitalizes on the panoramas unmatched ability to glide through the water. Fishing the Panorama weightless allows this bait to glide better than any bait I have ever seen. When I'm fishing these weightless, I will typically cast it out and let it fall to the bottom on semi-slacked line. And when this bait falls to the bottom, it's going to fall with the hook point up because the majority of the weight of the hook is on the underside here and it falls incredibly slowly and drifts down to the bottom. And a lot of times, you're going to get hit on the fall. But if I don't get hit on the fall, I will let this thing fall to the bottom and I will just let it sit there for a few seconds. After letting the bait sit for a few seconds, I will give it a very gentle pop and that will cause it to glide forward and then once again, fall down and come to a stop. If you're too aggressive with that pop, this bait will glide extremely far. It's going to create a lot of slack in your line, and if it does get eaten, you won't feel the bite because you'll have so much slack in your line because this thing will glide super, super far. 
Now I have had this bait eaten immediately following the gentle pop, and I have also had it eaten after letting it sit on the bottom for several seconds. So I feel like the gentle pops and those pauses are equally important. Now unless I'm throwing this up into laydowns or skipping it up underneath docks, I prefer to use a hybrid hook. This is the Sixth Sense Jugular Hybrid Hook. And this hook does make the presentation less weedless. As you can see, that hook point is exposed there, but it's definitely going to help with your hookup ratio. And one of the cool things about the Panorama is that you have a lot of plastic on either side of the hook point here. And since this thing falls with the hook point up, if you're fishing on top of grass or hydrilla or anything like that, it's going to fall down and rest on top of that grass and keep that hook point from getting mixed up in it. But like I said, if you are throwing this up around sticks or structure or casting it up under docks, I'd probably go with an EWG hook that lays flat against the surface. All right, rigging method number two is the drop shot. And we touched earlier on the Panorama's remarkable ability to undulate in the water, and the drop shot technique allows for maximum undulation throughout the entire body of the bait. This is my most common setup here. This is the 3.5 inch size on a size one hook, but you can drop down to the two inch size on a size two hook or keep it on the size one. And if you want, you can go up to the five inch size with about a one odd or a two odd hook. In theory, you could absolutely drop shot with the 6.5 or even the nine inch, but you definitely have to upsize the hook and you might want to reinforce the head a little bit just so you don't lose the bait. And I'm gonna show you a way to do that a little bit later. When I fish these on the drop shot, I will cast it out, let my weight fall all the way to the bottom, and then it's just gentle shakes of that rod and that's going to create that undulation. And every once in a while, I'll give it a little hop. So now we've covered the weightless rigging method, which allows for maximum gliding ability and the drop shot method, which allows for maximum undulation. And you might be thinking to yourself, oh boy, weightless and drop shot. We've seen that before, but my third rigging method allows for both of those actions and then some. It's a more versatile method that you might not have seen before. And don't skip ahead, but the fourth and final rigging method I'm going to show you produces an action that you definitely have not seen before because I discovered it. All right, our third rigging method is the hover rig by Core Tackle. And right here, this is what it looks like right out of the package. And this is what it looks like inside of the panorama. And with this method, we can achieve a gliding action, we can achieve a flutter action, we can also achieve undulation with the freedom that this tail has. And when you rig this bait a specific way with the hover rig, you can create what I can only describe as extreme water displacement. I'll show you in a minute. So the first way that I like to fish the panorama on the hover rig is to rig it up right behind the eye here, and I will cast it out and let it pendulum glide down to the bottom. And once it is on the bottom, I will just give it gentle shakes just to get that twitch in the tail, that gentle undulation. And that is often when the bass will come and just suck it right up. After a few seconds, if you haven't drawn a strike, you can lift your rod tip up and let it pendulum glide forward some more and then just repeat that twitch again on the bottom. All right, the second way I like to fish this on the hover rig is to rig it center weighted. And it's easy to get the weight centered horizontally because the bait is symmetrical. But centering it vertically is a little bit more tricky. You don't necessarily want to center it lengthwise because you have more plastic on the head end than you do on the tail end. It's thinner down here. So instead of rigging it up here, we're gonna be more like right about here. Not up in the nose like we were before, but more like right about there. So here is what it looks like in the bait. We have centered that weight in the middle of all that plastic. So now instead of that downward gliding action that we got from weighting it in the nose, we're going to cast it out and on semi-slack line, we're gonna let it fall and it's going to very slowly flutter like this all the way down to the bottom. And it's very difficult to demonstrate this in my tiny testing tank because there's simply not enough room, but we're just going to let it flutter down all the way to the bottom. And then once it comes to a rest on the bottom, we'll pause for a couple seconds, and then we're gonna give this a quick jerk up off the bottom. And when you have the bait center weighted like this and you jerk it up off the bottom, it comes up sideways like this and pushes a tremendous amount of water. 
The force that you generate by pulling this bait sideways against the water is so strong that it will put a bend in your rod. You may even think you have a fish on the line. You'll see in the testing tank here that the water displacement is so strong with this method that it pulls the rocks up off the bottom of the tank. So if I'm fishing in super low light conditions or super muddy water where those predators are going to be relying heavily on their lateral lines as opposed to their eyesight, this is the way I'm going to rig it because they will definitely be able to detect that from a mile away. So again, you'll let it fall on semi-slacked line, it'll flutter to the bottom, you'll rip it up moving a ton of water, and then you'll let it fall again on semi-slack line down to the bottom and just repeat. And if you're thinking that this presentation seems a bit wacky, what I want you to do is imagine jigging this bait vertically rigged this way through the ice for lake trout and walleye. Do you think if I use this five inch shad and jig it up off the bottom and let it flutter back down that a walleye or lake trout isn't going to come scoop it up? I can't say for certain, but I'm definitely going to try it if we actually get some ice here in Michigan this year. All right now, our fourth and final rigging method is the Rollin' Strollin' Jig Head by Queen Tackle. You might recognize this odd looking jig head from its debut at iCast 2024 and the incredible action that they're able to create on traditional hover style minnow baits. So what I envisioned when I originally decided to try these out on the panorama baits was to rig it up like this and create that same rolling side to side action. And what I thought was going to happen was that the bait would roll side to side like this with a steady popping retrieve. And it absolutely does not work like that. The flat design of this bait simply resists the water too much to allow for it to roll. So it really just, it's erratic and it looks terrible. But I didn't want to give up on it, so I came up with another theory and thought, why don't I center weight that jig head just like I did with the hover rig? So rigged up, this is what we're looking at right here. As you can see, that jig head and the tie-in point there are center weighted. And you're going to be more limited with the sizes of the panorama that you can fish with this rigging method. I find that the 3.5 inch and the 5 inch are both viable sizes to fish on the roll and stroll and jig head. But this combination right here is definitely the easiest to fish. This is the 1 8 ounce 2 watt jig head and the 3.5 inch panorama. If you're going to do this with the five inch baits, you wanna go up to the quarter ounce four rot jig head. All right, now I've got this tied on so I can do my best to demonstrate and explain how this works. And then I'm going to show you in the tank. And the knot that I've used here to tie on the bait is crucial to the presentation. This is the non-slip loop knot. And if you're not familiar with it, that's not a big deal. I will leave a link to my tutorial on the non-slip loop knot down in the description of the video. So what we're going to do is cast this bait out and then let it fall on slacked line. And because the weight of the jig head is center weighted on the bait and lies on one side of the bait, it will flutter to the bottom with the hook point down like this. Now when you give your rod a pop, that line is going to flip the bait over as the momentum of the jig head is carried to the other side, and then it's going to fall down once again on slacked line, this time with the line on the opposite side. And when you give your rod another pop, it's going to flip that bait over again, and the momentum of the jig head is going to carry it over once again to the side we started on. And this action is what happens with any minnow style bait on the roll and stroll and jig heads, but the panorama is a bit different. Because the bait is flat, when you roll it over, the force of the water on the inside of the bait causes it to kick out. Instead of a tight rolling motion like you would get with a minnow style bait, what you get instead is a wide swinging 360 degree flip back and forth. And I'll let a physicist correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure this is the first jig head ever created which utilizes centrifugal force to create the action. So the way that I'll fish this is to cast it out, let it flutter down on slacked line like this, and I'll give it three or four flips back and forth, and then I'll let it fall again on slack line fluttering down toward the bottom. So now let's go over to the tank and watch this thing in action set to some music because this is some real gravity defying matrix type stuff.
That was pretty cool. Now I'd like to name some other rigging methods that I feel warrant an honorable mention. These methods are viable, but in my opinion did not capitalize on the panorama's design as well as the four we've already discussed. The first of these is the Ozark Rig by Core Tackle, and this is a great way to fish weedless around structure and low in the water column, and it really capitalizes on the panorama's ability to glide through the water. However, the Ozark Rig does tear up the front of the panorama baits pretty badly, but I do have a hack that I'm going to show you guys in a little bit which can help with that. The second honorable mention goes to the Free Rig, which is going to give you most of the benefits of the weightless presentation, but it's going to be a lot more efficient for you if you're fishing in deeper water because you'll get it down to the fish much quicker. The third and final honorable mention is going to be shared by several different rigging methods and those are the Tokyo Rig, the Jika Rig, the Ned Rig, and the Shaky Head. These are all just different ways of bottom rigging the baits and they will all work, especially in beds. However, I don't feel like you're gaining anything from using the panorama with these rigging methods versus using another bait, say a creature bait or a crawl style bait. I know these methods are popular with some guys, especially when it comes to fishing around beds, but like I said, in those same scenarios, I think if you rig up any big, obnoxious looking soft plastic, it's going to do the same thing. I mean, I guess if I was a bass defending a bed, I would be pretty surprised to see a dying shad flutter in to steal those eggs. All right, that's going to do it for my rigging methods. Now let's move on to some hacks for the panorama baits. There is one complaint that I have heard time and time again with the panorama baits, and it is that they have an extremely offensive chemical smell. And I've heard this complaint before about other baits, only to find that the reports have been exaggerated, but these smell like nuclear diarrhea. Let me preface this by saying I love the baits, I love the concept, and they're super effective, but they have the worst chemical smell of any baits I have ever purchased. And I noticed that the smell was a lot stronger with the first round of Panorama baits that I purchased directly through Sixth Sense. They were undoubtedly very fresh from the manufacturer, but when I purchased them again indirectly through Fish USA, I noticed that the smell was significantly decreased, and I assume that is because they had been shipped over to Fish USA and had had more time to sit on the shelf and air out, but those initial baits were the strongest smelling baits ever. Now, when we're talking specifically about bass fishing, there is a popular school of thought that scent has no bearing on whether or not a fish will bite. And it is true that bass are primarily sight hunters. However, I do think that there are certain times of the year and certain situations where scent plays a major role, particularly later in the year in the mid-fall through the winter. Later in the year when the water is cold, and especially in areas where fishing pressure has been high, I'll start to see a lot more of those investigative bites where the fish will come up to it and investigate the bait before they eat it. They'll even come up and hit it with their mouth closed. And a lot of people don't realize, but bass actually have a complex olfactory system, and they have taste buds even on the outsides of their mouth. And outside of bass, scent and taste definitely play a role in predation with varying degree dependent on the species. And I do think the offensive chemical smell of the panorama is offensive enough to make an impact on whether or not some fish will eat the bait. But this is a problem that is easily fixed. The first thing you want to do upon receiving your panorama baits is just to take them all out of the package and let them air out. And I've got mine sitting on a paper towel, and that's just so none of the oily residue gets on my table. And if you've got a fresh batch, you'll know it right away, and you may want to consider airing those out in an area that is more well ventilated, like a garage, because if you air them out in a tight space, like I did the first time here in my room, it will smell up the entire room. And after your baits have aired out for a day or two, the smell will not be completely gone, but it will be reduced drastically. And then in order to mask any odor that remains, I'm going to recommend that you use a bait scent or attractant. And my go-tos are the Procure Shad Super Gel or the Minnow Bait Oil. The Procure stuff is made from real bait fish and I find that it absolutely does make a difference. And if it looks like a shad, it moves like a shad, it smells and tastes like a shad, it's a shad. Now one word of caution I'm going to pass on to you guys is to not attempt to marinate these baits in any type of oil. 
One of the first things that I tried to do was to marinate these baits in the minnow oil using my Plano liquid bait storage container and I left them in the oil overnight and they became stiff and rigid and basically unusable so I destroyed an entire pack of panorama baits. All right, now the second hack that I'm going to be showing you is a method that I use for preemptively reinforcing or repairing my panorama baits. And we're going to be doing that by nose dipping our baits in some clear hard formula plastazol. I'm going to reinforce this damaged 3.5 inch panorama along with some other three and a half inch panoramas that I plan on using for the drop shot. As you can see, that bait has been ripped wide open. And I'm also going to reinforce a couple of five inch baits that I want to fish on the Ozark rig. So I'm just going to remelt some leftover clear hard plastazol in my Pyrex measuring cup here and get that heated up to about 350 degrees Fahrenheit in the microwave. And then I'll just nose dip each of those panorama baits and hang them up to cool. And here is our finished result. As you can see, any visual changes to the baits are very minimal. If anything, the heads might be a little bit more shiny, but this plastic, this clear hard plastazol up front is significantly tougher, and that's going to aid us in the durability of our baits using most of the rigging methods that we discussed today. And this bait right here is the one that we cut up front, and as you can see, we can no longer separate that because it has been reinforced by that clear hard plastazol. And just in case you're concerned about the buoyancy being affected, you may notice that this bait is wet, and that is because I placed it in my testing tank and it still floats just like it did before. And if you're concerned about cost, I have used that same plastazol that you guys saw in my cup to reinforce about 100 other baits, not just panorama baits, but other baits as well. And I have barely put a dent in it. If I had to guess, I could reinforce another two or 3,000 baits with that same amount of plastazol before I'd have to refill it with some more. And that amount of plastazol probably cost less than a dollar. So we're talking about a very negligible amount of money per bait in order to reinforce these and get several more uses than you otherwise would. All right guys, that is going to do it for the video. And if you did enjoy it, do whatever you want and I will see you guys in the next one.